So today's reading uh, from the literature of the Hebrews, it starts with a beautiful introduction. The Holy Spirit says, what a great way to start a reading. The, whole, the Holy Spirit says, if you would only listen to him today, do not harden your hearts as happened in the rebellion on the day of temptation in the wilderness. And then our psalm goes on to repeat it, it, like the psalm version of, of that same uh, event. Basically, when the people were freed from slavery in Egypt, uh, they were in the desert. And even though they had seen God's miracles, they had seen uh, the, the, the Red Sea part, walls of water to the right and to the left of them, they'd seen the sea close in on Pharaoh and his chariots and on his horsemen. They'd been guided by a pillar of fire at at night to go ahead of them, a pillar of cloud, then behind them to uh, confuse the, the Egyptians and so on and so forth. They had seen the Lord's providence and yet out in the desert, very, very quickly, they doubt him. They doubt him and they start to blame him. They start to accuse him. Have you led, have you led us out into this place to die? They said, this place is no water. It's an arid place. And, but rather than kneeling, bending low, imploring God and asking for his help. They grumble against him. They blame him. This attitude, uh, I think, is still, is still present. It's still present today. Uh, we can very, very quickly blame God. And this is a, it's a question that often comes up as well in school retreats and things like that. Uh, you know, if God is so good, why, are there, why is there starvation? Why are there wars? If God is so good, why does cancer exist? All these kind of, th kind of things. Uh, immediately, as soon as there's a problem, I think, yeah, it's because God, God doesn't care. That's why. That's why there's a problem, because God doesn't care. Because God isn't interested. Uh, he cares about the important people or holy people, but not, not about us, not about me, not about you, not about your problems. He cares about the environment, right? But he doesn't care about each individual person and their needs and their families, which, of course, is complete rubbish. Hence, the Holy Spirit says, if you would listen to him today, do not harden your hearts. The voice of the Lord is an interesting, it's an interesting thing because, because do you want to hear it? Do you want to hear the voice of God? Most people say, yeah, go, of course I do. Do you though? Do you? Because what do you think he'd say to you? Do you, do, do you actually want to hear his voice? Yeah, if you can imagine, like, some people might, might maybe want to hear his voice kind of with the idea that it would be almost, if you will, entertaining. You know, it would be, be kind of a miraculous thing. I mean, you hear this big booming voice and you know, the, the, the clouds peel open and out down comes, oh, man, that's cool. You know, I mean, it, it would be kind of a good boasting point or somehow entertaining, right? But, but would you seriously, do you seriously actually want to hear God's voice? Do you? I think for a lot of people, the, the idea sounds good, but then the more they think about it, and the, the, the reality of what might God actually say? This is where it gets a bit risky. Because we do like, we do like to have control of our lives. We do like to have control, or at least the, uh, the apparent control of our lives and our destiny and where we're going and, and our success and our health and our finances. So what if, what if God does speak? Is he going to start ruining my plans? Is he going to start changing things? So do you actually want to hear him? My guess is the more you think about it, the more you might actually be somewhat intimidated to hear God speak. Because he might say something that leaves you feeling uncomfortable. And today, that's a cardinal sin, to make people feel uncomfortable. We have to make people feel comfortable, whatever they do. You have to be comfortable doing that. And if you feel comfortable doing it, then that's right. Which again, of course, is complete rubbish. Because children feel very comfortable doing stupid things and doing things that they shouldn't be doing at all. And he may feel very, very comfortable sitting on his sister's head, but that doesn't mean it's a good thing to do. And you may be very, very comfortable 
uh, defrauding your boss, the state, your wife, whatever it may be. It may be actually, you may be quite used to it at this point. It doesn't make it right. So just because something is comfortable doesn't make it right, doesn't make it good. So if God were to speak into your life, what would he actually say? Now, we also have to keep in mind that when God's, if and when God would speak into our lives, it's not that necessarily it's all going to be a list of thou shalt nots and thou must change. Of course not. It won't be. It won't be that. But there may be a part of that. There may be an element of that there. Absolutely. So do you want to hear God's voice? Because keep in mind, if you hear God's voice, you then have a greater responsibility in his sight. God speaks to you. You can't plead ignorance of the law. If God speaks to you and you hear it, and he says, um, those things that you're watching on the internet, cut that out. And you go, "Mm mm-hmm. Thanks for the message. But I've been doing it for years. Like, I mean, I wish it's one more time. <laughs> what difference does it make? Or, do you know what I mean? And you keep going. Or if he asks to ask you to give more time to your kids or give more time to prayer. Or, yeah, root out some, some vice. And you say, Psh, makes me feel uncomfortable having to try and be holy. So I'd rather not. Now you have a greater responsibility because God has spoken to you. So you, you, you can't plead ignorance. You can't say, I didn't know. So do you want to hear God's voice? By the way, I really shouldn't be making it sound like we shouldn't want to hear God's voice. We really, really should want to hear God's voice. But what I'm saying is there's, there's, there's a responsibility attached to it. It's not, this isn't a, it's kind of a walk in the park. God will speak to me. God will, God will not speak to me, whatever. Like, if God speaks to your heart, this isn't just another person speaking or another opinion laid out before you. This is the creator of the universe giving time and love to you, speaking not just at you, but into your heart. And, and with that, like, it's just, uh, there's, there's, there's a, a beauty and, and a peace, and at the same time, a, a wonderful challenge. It's like when someone, you re, someone whose opinion you really, really, really value, you know, there might be just like one or two people in your life and you love, it just it makes your world when they say, well done. You know, you did that well. It might be, I don't know, a friend, a husband, a wife, uh, someone who maybe back in the day, someone that you were interested in, you know, someone that you fancied kind of thing. And when they look at you and say, it's a nice dress, it just kind of makes, it just makes your life. It just makes your world, you know? So sometimes there are people whose, whose opinion we really, really just hang on. Imagine then that the Lord speaks to you and what you hear and what you understand is the words of of someone who's, in those moments, I would imagine, whose opinion you really, really care about. Because you know this is God. So even, and I'm not sure if you've ever had the experience of someone like, I I know the the founder of my community, Father Paul, I'll tell you a little story. Um, on one occasion was I a priest? I'm not sure if I was a priest or a deacon Uh, but we had our retreat in Slovakia so there were uh, 350 people out in the congregation and I had the ciborium so the the gold bowl for the the Holy Communion now our our retreat takes place there, there are too many of us for any of our houses, so we have to rent out, basically, it's, it's a sports hall, we build a stage on it. So, you're walking on a stage, and our sisters love candles, and they love flowers, which means there's no room at all to move around the place. So you, you've got your ciborium, and the, the tabernacle is, there are 17,000 candles in front of the tabernacle, and we wear flowing robes, which are flammable. <laughs> Okay, so then you've also got lilies, and you can, the lilies will stay in the vestments. So you try and get, you, you, you need two hands on the ciborium. So basically, you've got two hands on the ciborium. You've got candles to watch. You have to negotiate candles and flowers in order to get to the tabernacle, open the tabernacle, and get the ciborium in, and get back out without getting burned. Okay, so basically, I was so concentrated on the flowers and the candles 
and I'm not tripping and not getting burned, that I carried the ciborium down here. Right? Because you know, you're kind of watching where you're going, how, trying, to, trying to negotiate a pathway through this jungle. And um, okay, that was grand. Then at the end of Mass, Father Paul just said in front of the whole community, and of course, you know, when we carry Jesus in our hearts, or when we carry Jesus in the ciborium, we carry him aloft because indeed he is the creator of the world and the of the and I just know. <laughs> and he, he, he didn't even correct me. You know, it, was, you know, it wasn't it was aimed at me. He didn't mention my name. He didn't intentionally embarrass me, but like he didn't make a show, but just because I care about his opinion, I just felt like the most useless little priest ever. You know, and ever since then, whoom, I, I, carry, I carry a ciborium at a head height. All right? But, and so, um, again, if God speaks to you, and you know this is like this divine voice, this loving voice, if he were to give you any sort of indication at all that maybe some of your behavior or actions are out of line, it should, it should provoke within us just this desire to please him. Because again, it's, it's not uh, because we know it's coming from someone who loves us. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts. Do you want to hear his voice? Because I think he wants to speak to you. But I also think he may not necessarily speak to us as much as we want because he doesn't want to increase our culpability, our responsibility. But he will speak to us as much as we need. And he will speak to us as much as we're capable of receiving. And very often, that speaking to us, we can maybe describe it this way. It comes in, 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 in the form of like a divine light that illuminates your conscience. So you simply know what you're supposed to do. You simply, or you simply know this is what God wants me to do. You haven't sat down and kind of worked out the pros and the cons and done the maths. You just simply know this is what God would have me do. It's kind of like uh, for those of us who are pro-life, I don't think anyone ever, for most of us anyway, no one had to sit down and explain why abortion was wrong and go through diagrams and graphs and pictures and all, all those horrific things that are available out there. No one had to kind of sit me down and show me that in order for me to know that abortion was wrong. Many people, a lot of people who are in prayer, just simply know. Because the presence of God in our lives, this makes a difference. This illuminates our conscience so that we know right and wrong. That's how God often speaks. I mean, there may be more dramatic uh, phenomenon as well through which he speaks. But very often that's how he speaks, in the silence of our hearts. In our interior life, in our conscience. Do you want to hear him speak? Do you want to hear his voice? Come in, let us bow and bend low. Let us kneel before the God who made us. For he is our God and we the people who belong to his pasture. The flock that is led by his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts. Amen.